So a bunch of times in the Old Testament, the name Jehovah is combined with another word, making like a super name, a more specific name for God. For example, in Genesis 22, after promises, a quarter of a century waiting, a stepson for his wife, Abraham finally had the promised child, Isaac. He must have watched that kid fall asleep every night. But then God said to him, uh, take Isaac and sacrifice him to me. And Abraham went to do so. Isaac's on the way up the mountain with his dad. He's like, uh, dad, where is the sacrifice? And then in Genesis 22, 8, Abraham says, the Lord will provide a sacrifice. Jehovah Jireh. A few verses later, with his son strapped down on some wood and his hand holding a knife in the air, Abraham hears his own name called. It was just a test. Whew. And there was a ram caught in a bush. So they sacrificed the ram. The Lord did provide. The place was called Mount Moriah. Abraham named it Jehovah Jireh, my provider. This place is a massive deal, by the way. It's the place where Solomon built the temple. It's the place where Ezra and Haggai rebuilt the temple. It's the place where Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers. It's the place where Jesus was condemned to die. That must be the most prophetic naming of a place ever. Abraham calls it Jehovah Jireh, and then centuries later, God did provide not just a ram to keep Abraham from sacrificing his son, but God sacrificed his own son for the sins of the entire world. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. God did provide. God does provide. We used to sing a song in kids' church. I won't sing it, I'll just say the lyrics. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. What if you believed that about God? What if when you need something, you prayed to Jehovah Jireh and believed that he was both Abraham and Earth's provider of a sacrifice? Through God's names, we learn more about God. My hope though is that it won't stop there, that you wouldn't just know more about God, but that you would truly know God. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all today. And today we're going to continue with the names of God. Today we're talking about Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. And so if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles or your apps to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, as you're turning there, there's two things I want to share with you. First of all, every time I fill a pulpit, it makes me incredibly thankful for my pastors. And we are very, very blessed here at Coastal, are we not? Second of all, um, I have some good news and bad news for you. The bad news is, is I have a 10-point outline today, okay? <laughs> but before you jump up and stampede for the exits, um, the good news is that I've timed it, and it should take me about 30 minutes, give or take, okay? So just relax. It's going to be okay. So if you would, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word today. Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Our Father in heaven, we come to you with grateful hearts today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit, and we thank you that you are the Lord, our provider. And I ask today, God, that you would provide the words for me to speak, and that you would speak to all of our hearts through your spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So today, we're going to take a deep dive, church, into the life of Abraham, okay? And we're going to end up in Genesis chapter 22, which is the only passage in Scripture that uses Jehovah Jireh. But before we get there, I want to give you kind of the backstory of Abraham because it's so important just for us to remember. So God comes to Abraham when he is 75 years old and his wife Sarah is 65, and he says to him, Abraham, I want you to move. I want you to leave your family, I want you to leave your friends, I want you to leave your home, and I want you to move to a place you've never been. And there I'm going to create a great nation out of you. That's a pretty big ask, is it not? Have you ever moved? It, it, it's an act of faith when you do that. Three years ago, my family and I moved from Pennsylvania, and the reason we moved, frankly, was the same reason that Abraham moved. We felt like God was moving us here. 
And it was hard for us to leave our family and our friends. And you know what? When people would ask you, why are you moving? And you said, well, we think God wants us to. Nobody's going to argue with God, you know, so they're not going to just come right out and say, you're crazy, okay? But they give you this look that basically says, are you sure you know what you're doing? Have you ever seen that look before? We probably all have, haven't we, at times, okay? But for Abraham, it had to have been so much harder because for him, he knew that when he moved away, he would never see his family again. For us, we can pick up the phone. We can do FaceTime, or we can jump in our car and head back to Pennsylvania. And eight hours later, we get, well, actually, it's not eight hours for us. When you have five kids, it's more like 11 or 12. Okay. <laughs> I, I feel very blessed when I can actually get out of the county before I have to stop for a bathroom break. <laughs> and this is way off topic, but when you have kids and you go into a public restroom, okay, um, you never know what's going to happen, okay? The question I get most often is we walk in there and they say, Daddy, what stinks in here? <clears throat> At the top of their lungs, okay? Abraham didn't have that problem though, okay? <laughs> But Abraham had just about everything you could possibly imagine. He had a beautiful wife. He had lots of cattle. He had lots of sheep. He had silver and gold. He had servants. It says he had 318 male servants who could fight. So if you can imagine that they all had families, this was quite an entourage that he had with him. In addition, he had respect. Everywhere he went, people respected him because he was a man of integrity and because God gave him favor. Most importantly, Abraham had a personal relationship with Jehovah. But one thing Abraham did not have was a son. And oftentimes the thing that we cannot have in life is the thing that we want the most, isn't it? And Abraham and Sarah wanted that son so badly. And at ages 75 and 65, they knew the biological clock was ticking. But, Ab- but God comes to him and he says, I'm going to give you a son. And it had to have meant so much to Abraham. You see, back then, having a son meant even more than it does to us today because your son was actually your retirement plan. Your son someday would take care of you when you were old. Okay? So oddly enough, I would be in the same boat as Abraham because even though I have a million kids, I don't have a son. <laughs> Now, I got another shot. In case you didn't know, my wife and I are expecting. She is due on September 4th, Labor Day. No pun intended. No pun intended by Labor Day there. But, um, and supposedly, I have a 50-50 chance of having a son. We'll see. We'll see, okay? But, <laughs> but God comes to him and he says, Abraham, you're going to have a son. And I am going to make a great nation out of you. And so I bet you that Abraham and Sarah got ready. And they expected that nine months later, they were going to have a baby. But it didn't happen nine months later, did it? And they waited a year. And they waited two. And they waited three. And they waited five. And they waited ten. Still no baby. And you know, sometimes one thing I really want to stress very strongly is that the moment we ask for something, if we ask according to God's will, he hears us and he gives us what we want. He provides in that moment. Matter of fact, it says that God provides, even he knows what we need, even before we ask him. God always provides for our needs. In Philippians 4.19, it says, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. In Psalm 37, David says, I have been young and now I am old, and yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. God knows exactly what we need, and he promises to provide, and God is not a man that he should lie. He always keeps his word. So when God says he's going to provide for you, and I don't know what needs you have today, I don't know if it's a financial need, I don't know if it's a physical need, I don't know if it's a health need, I don't know if it's an emotional need, but whatever that need is, God will provide for you. But sometimes between the promise and the fulfillment, there's a gap of time, isn't there? There's a gap. And in that gap, we have to wait. And waiting is really hard, is it not? Patience is a virtue that we want everyone else to have. <clears throat> and so we see that in Genesis chapter 15, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. 
But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Abraham was tired of waiting. And also, waiting, not only can it be hard, but waiting can be scary. And you can see that in this passage. God said, don't be afraid, Abraham. <clears throat> There's a to- story I'd like to tell a couple, of, actually a long time ago. A friend of mine and I went to Cedar Point. Um, to yell, no sound came out. And we're going through all those twists and turns and everything. And we come into the station at the end of the ride. And I look at my friend. And he is squinting like this. And he is holding tightly to the lady's ponytail in front of him. <laughs> and I said, Rex, Rex, let go of her hair, please. And he's, oh, I am so sorry. And the lady said, you know what? We were going so fast, I never even felt a thing. Okay? But sometimes life is like that roller coaster. Okay? We know that we have a need. We know that God is going to provide. But in between the time we get on that roller coaster and the time we end, we kind of forget about it, don't we? And we start worrying and we start stressing out. And we see that crisis ahead of us. And we don't act in faith, we act in fear. And God comes along as he always does and he provides. And he solves that problem. But we barely notice because we're now focused on the next crisis. Are you with me there? Is it just me? We all do this, don't we? Okay? And God wants us, God wants us to focus on him. The other thing is, is that sometimes we have our own ideas of how we want God to provide for us, don't we? We have this perfect picture. There's a story told about a pastor who was talking to God and he said, God, how much is a million years to you? And God said, one second. And he said, God, how much is a million dollars to you? And he said, one penny. And so the pastor said, God, can I have one of your pennies? (laughs) And God said, wait a second. God has his own ideas, and we have our own ideas, okay? When we were moving here, we decided to, um, we looked at um, a certain neighborhood in Manteo, And we looked at two houses. We looked at the house we have, and we looked at another house. And after we walked through those houses, we decided that we were going to make an offer on the other house. So we made that offer. We felt really good about it, but we didn't get the house. And so we went back to God, and we said, God, um, what is it that you want us to do? Is it you're telling us not to move to to Manteo, or is it that you just want us to move to another house there? And so we prayed about it for two weeks. And finally, we felt like, no, no, God wants us to move there. Um, But it's just a different plan. He has a different house for us. And so we went back and we made an offer on the other house, the first house. And within an hour, it was ours. It happened so fast, I actually freaked out. And, but anyway, in between the time we signed that contract and the time we moved here, um, I started wondering, well, why didn't God give us that other house? It had an extra bedroom, it was newer. I just felt like it fit our family better. But when we actually moved into our home, I realized that God knew best. Because it had a bigger kitchen for us, which is huge. It had a bigger living room, it had a private backyard. It was the perfect place for us. God knew what was best, he had a different plan for us. But as we're in that gap of time between the promise and the fulfillment, we have a choice to make. We can choose to keep our eyes on God or we can keep our eyes on our circumstances. And it is so hard to keep our eyes on God. We want to focus on our experience, don't we? Pastor said something as we were um, talking last week that I thought was really good. He said, our experience doesn't change who God is, but it can become the greatest battle we have. Isn't that true? One of the things I used to do with my children when they were younger is I would take them out of the baseball field next to our house and I'd put them on the bleachers and I'd ask them to do a faith exercise. This was specifically something I did with Skye because Skye was a, a drug baby and we adopted her from foster care. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, our therapist told us she needs to, to relax more and she needs to be able to trust you. And so we did these trust exercises. So I put her on the bleachers and I'd say, honey, I want you to jump to me. And she'd look down at the ground and say, no, daddy, I can't. I'm going to fall. I'm so scared. And I'd say, honey, don't look at the ground. Look at me. 
focus on me. And when she focused on me and she kept her eyes on me, she was able to jump. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to keep our eyes on him. You see, as humans, we want to find our happiness in our circumstances. But God wants us to find our happiness in him, regardless of our circumstances. So finally, point number five, we get to the gift. When Abraham was 99 years old, God came to him in the flesh in a theophany. He sat in Abraham's tent, and he had dinner with Abraham. And after dinner, he said to Abraham, at this time next year, you will have a son. And we know the story. Sarah was overhearing, and she laughed. And God said, why? Why is Sarah laughing? Is there anything too hard for me? And so Abraham and his son, sure, and Abraham and Sarah, the next year, sure enough, God was true to his word, and they had that son. And can you just imagine how happy they had to have been? After 25 years of waiting, they had the gift. God revealed his provision to them, and they had that son. It had to have been amazing. He had to have been the apple of their eye, and I mean, they were old enough to be his great-grandparents, so I bet you they spoiled him to death, okay? And yet, that son grew up, and as he grew, they probably, that bond of love continued to increase. And then we get to Genesis chapter 22. But before we talk about this, one thing I'd like to share with you is when my wife and I first got married, I had actually just started in business. And if you ever started a business, you know that lots of times the first couple of years are really rough. And I get paid kind of oddly. I get paid four times a year. I get paid once a quarter, okay? And so if I run out of money before I run out of month, I have a real problem, okay? And, and back then, I had enough income coming in to cover our bills for two out of every three months. And so my wife had to get a job to cover that third month. And after a couple of years, she said, honey, I really want to quit. I want to start a family. And we prayed about it and we thought about it and we, we really felt like God wanted us to do it. But I just couldn't take that step of faith. I would say, hon, no, you can't quit. We need the money. <clears throat> you cannot do it. And one day my father was talking to me and he said, son, I know your wife really wants to quit. Do you feel like God wants you to have a family? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, so why aren't you letting her quit? And I said, because the numbers don't add up. And he said to me, he said, son, if God wants you to do something, he will provide regardless of whether the numbers work or not. And you know what happened that year? I had the best year up until that time in my business. He doubled my business. Not only did he meet my wants and my needs, but he met a lot of our wants as well. He provided in such an incredible way. And so finally we see in Genesis chapter 22 in verse 1, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Have you ever had a gift taken away? It's really hard, isn't it? I remember when we um, started foster care, and we got Michaela. She was two days old right out of the hospital, and we knew that we were going to have a period of time when they would try to reunify her with her birth family, and we were prepared for that. And so for 18 long months, we went through that reunification process, and at the very end, the judge said, I'm going to terminate parental rights, and Mac and Annie, you will be able to adopt her. And we were so excited. We were so happy. We were thrilled. And literally like a week later, one of Michaela's relatives stepped forward and said, I want to adopt her. And the judge decided to give her a shot. Doesn't happen very often, it was extremely rare. And my wife and I felt like we had just got punched in the gut. And so for 10 more months, we waited as the judge tried to vet this lady. And finally, at the end of the day, um, 
she said, nope, you know what? Michaela's been with Mac and Annie for over two years now, and we're going to let them keep her. It was such a, a provision. But in that time, we felt like the gift was going to be taken away from us. And it was hard. It was so hard. We wondered at times, God, why are you doing this? You gave us this gift, and now you're ripping it away. I can't even imagine what Abraham went through that night. Can you? The, the thoughts and the feelings that had to have gone through his mind. First of all, it makes absolutely no sense. He promised him a son, and there he's got the son. Second of all, it com- completely goes against the very nature of God for this request. Okay? Thirdly, we all know what our rights are, don't we? Okay? And that gift was his right, so to speak. We know what our rights are. Even when you're a little kid, you know what your rights are. Okay? I remember the story one time of Daniela. Daniela was four, Havel was three. And when you're three years old, the highlight of your day is flushing the toilet. <laughs> And I remember one time Daniela had gone to the bathroom, and she's really going to be very mad at me. Where is she? Is she here? There she is. Okay. <laughs> I love you, baby. Okay. But anyway, so Daniela had gone to the bathroom, and Havla said, can I flush it? And Dan said, no. And my wife was standing right there, and she said, oh, just let Hava flush it. No, please. No, that poop came out of my butt, and I'm going to flush the toilet. We know what our rights are, even when we're little, don't we? Okay. And Abraham knew what his rights were. But instead of fighting with God, he just obeyed. And we see that in verse 3. We see Abraham and his great faith. His faith has grown over the years. His faith has grown to something just incredible. And faith requires two things. First of all, faith requires action. And then faith requires words. The action we see in verse 3, count all these verbs in here with me. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God told him. It says in James that faith without works is dead. And he had faith. He had the actions to back it up. But also, it requires words. We see that in verse 4 and 5. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told his servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. There were words there, too. And so you see that faith that faith. Charles Stanley says God does not require us to understand his will, but just to obey it, even when it seems unreasonable. And Abraham did this in this instance, does he? Did he not? So we see Jehovah Jireh revealed next. I'm going to start reading in verse 9. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me your son, even your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yira, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. My father has a saying, it goes like this. God is never late, and he is rarely early, but he is always on time. That's a perfect saying for this, is it not? Can you imagine um, Abraham with his hand in the air with that knife? Tony Evans in the book says, as Abraham and Isaac were trudging up the one side of the mountain, the ram was coming up the other side. And at just that time, before Abraham plunged that knife into his son's heart, God stopped him and showed him the ram of provision. 
I have a story that I'd like to read you. A little girl bought a plastic pearl necklace with money she had been saving all year. She loved her pearls and felt so grown up when she wore them. She only took them off when she went swimming or took a bath. Though the pearls weren't real, that didn't matter to her. She had bought them all by herself. The little girl had a loving father. One day he said to her, Honey, do you love me? Yes, Daddy, she said. You know I love you. Then will you give me your pearls? Her father asked. Not my pearls, the little girl practically gasped. But you can have my toy horse. That's okay, sweetheart. I love you, he replied. And then he kissed her cheek. About a week later, the father asked his little girl again, Do you love me? Daddy, you know I love you, she said. Then will you give me your pearls, he repeated. Not my pearls, but I'll give you my baby doll. That's okay, I love you, the father answered. And once again, he gave her a kiss on the cheek. This same routine happened again and again. And the little girl began to wonder, If Daddy loves me, why does he want to take away something I love? Then one day, the little girl walked up to her father with tears in her eyes and held out the fake pearl necklace. Here, Daddy, this is for you, she said. The father reached out a hand to take the necklace, and with his other hand, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a velvet case. Inside that case was a strand of genuine pearls, chosen with love and care for his daughter. He had had the pearls all along, but was waiting for his daughter to give up what she had so that he could give her something better. You know, we can ask ourselves, why did God do this to Abraham? And I don't know that we'll fully understand until we get to heaven, and I think we could probably come up with a bunch of reasons right now, but there's two reasons that I can think of. Number one, God wanted to experience Abraham's faith. It says in verse 12, now I know that you fear me. Now, did God know what Abraham was going to do before it happened? Absolutely. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything. But God wanted to experience Abraham's faith. And the example I would use is think of your favorite food that you love to eat, okay? For me, it's steak. And the other day, my wife and I had a steak, and it was a perfect cut. It was cooked medium rare. We piled it high with mushrooms and onions. It was amazing. And even though I've had steak many times, I wanted to experience it again. I wanted to experience it one more time. Actually, I'd like to experience it a lot more times. But... I wanted to experience that steak, even though I know what it tastes like. And God is that with us. He wants to experience your faith. He wants to experience my faith. It's an act of worship that he loves. But second, and probably more importantly, God wants to know that we are choosing the giver over the gift. He wants us to know that we are putting him first in our lives, that we have no other gods before him. And when we make that choice, we find out that we get a better gift. I have a feeling Abraham never looked at his son in the same way again. But he got something else too. He got Jehovah Jireh. He got a closer relationship with God. Martin Luther said this, I have held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands that I still possess. Last but not least, we see the giver became the gift. 2,000 years after Abraham and Isaac walked up that hill, another son walked up that very same hill, carrying a cross. And this time at the top, God did not spare his son's life, but he sacrificed him for us all. And he gave us the most important gift. He gave us eternal life. He gave us that relationship, that spiritual provision for us. So folks, I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what you need God to provide. I do know we all need something, don't we? I don't know when that provision will be revealed, but I do know that God will provide. He has already provided for you. And as you are walking up that mountain, the ram of provision is coming up the other side. And at just the right time, 
your provision will be revealed to you. Because we have Jehovah Jireh as our friend. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And there is nothing too hard for him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Abraham. And I thank you for the tremendous faith that he had. And most importantly, I thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are the God that provides. I just pray, Lord, for everybody in this room today that you would help them to have the faith, that you would help them to have the patience during the gap, and that at just the right time you would provide in the ways they need it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.